If anyone here has a Linux laptop, I was thinking of doing an unconventional demo toward the end, the time that remains uh, after my talk is over. And that is, instead of me demoing, demoing the software that I'm talking about, somebody else does. So if you've got a Linux or a Sigwin laptop, uh, think about whether you want to volunteer a little later on to install some software, just open source software, it's the official release of an open source package, and install it and play with it. Okay, so I'm uh, really glad to be back here at SDC in person. My name is Terence Kelly. I'm presenting some joint work with several co-authors who couldn't make it. I'm here to talk about persistent memory for interpreted scripting languages. I'll explain the right kind of persistence for scripting and how my co-authors and I prototyped it. The official version of an industrial strength scripting language interpreter now includes a generalization of the persistence feature that we prototyped. Both the prototype and the industrial strength interpreter use my persistent memory allocator, which I'll also describe. Persistent scripting does not require non-volatile memory nor any other kind of unconventional hardware. A 10-year-old laptop works fine for all the software described in this talk, all of which is open source. So mainstream non-volatile memory programming has usually meant low-level languages like C and C++. These offer high machine efficiency and hardware control. For example, they make it easy to use special instructions such as cache line flush instructions that are required to fully exploit non-volatile memory hardware. Unfortunately, low-level languages aren't optimal for programmer efficiency and productivity. At the other end of the spectrum, scripting languages deliberately sacrifice hardware efficiency and control for programmer convenience and productivity. They try to do what you mean without forcing you to say it explicitly. For example, they don't require variable declarations. Now you'd think that scripting languages would support persistence in a similar carefree spirit, but they don't. Compared with the convenience of other aspects of scripting, persistence is exceptionally bothersome. Languages like Perl and Python today each offer a half dozen or more persistence options. All of them are overt, manual, and require fussing with individual programmer-defined variables. For example, the programmer can bind an associative array to a DBM database. Woohoo! what fun. Um, another approach is to use a completely transparent checkpoint restore mechanism, such as CRIU, to halt a running script interpreter and resume it later. My colleagues and I tried that. The problem is that this provides the wrong kind of transparency. The interpreter doesn't know when it has been resurrected, so scripts must include ugly code to figure out, for example, what inputs they should read this time around. Lots of programming fuss. Now let's consider a simple example problem that will help us to recognize a better approach to persistence when we see it. This little awk script captures the essence of a very common scripting chore, processing log files. My dissertation research 20 years ago relied heavily on scripts like this one to process web server logs. The top half of this script is a block that executes once per line of input. It treats each line as a string, assigns serial numbers to strings, and counts the frequencies of strings. The bottom half of this script is an end block that executes after all input has been processed. It prints a summary report. So what does this have to do with persistence? persistence? Well, we need persistence in common scenarios where inputs arrive incrementally and the summary must cover all past inputs. For example, a new log file arrives every day and our daily summary report must cover all logs that we've ever received. Naively reading the entire archive of n log files on day n is untenable because it's too, too inefficient. We need an incremental approach which requires persistence. Well, here's some homebrew manual persistence code to make our little script incremental. We prepend to our script this begin block, which reads yesterday's summary report and restores script variables, the scalar variable n and the two associative arrays, to the state they were in after reading yesterday's input, which works. But now our formerly pleasant little script has nearly doubled in size. And all we've accomplished with the new code is restoring the script to its state at the end of its previous execution, which tells us something. 
we realize that precisely the kind of persistence we need for scripting is simply to remember the state of all script-defined variables from one execution to the next. The begin block here is one way for us to arrange the remembering ourselves manually. But why can't the interpreter handle the remembering? <clears throat> Indeed, the interpreter can and should remember variables if we ask it to do so. The right interface for this capability is very simple. We tell the in interpreter that script variables live in a specified file called the heap file, for reasons that will be obvious in a moment. The interpreter knows how to find variables in the heap file whenever it needs them. The easiest way to implement persistence is to slide a persistent heap beneath the script interpreter. If we do that, we get several benefits. Most importantly, persistence becomes effortless. Script programmers write zero code to save and restore script variables across executions. Our little awk script, for example, doesn't need the begin block on the previous slide. Furthermore, a persistent heap full of script variables can be shared freely between unrelated scripts, which is easier and more efficient than passing around text files. Finally, this approach to persistence allows us to decouple data ingestion from data analysis. We can read data once and query it happily ever after. The common analytic operation of looking up data in associative arrays remains a constant time operation. You don't have to reload an associative array in any sense uh, into memory before you can uh, look up a single element in it. There are two closely related implementations of persistent scripting. Their interfaces and under the hood plumbing differ a little bit. The first implementation is the prototype that my co-authors and I developed based on a fork of the GNU awk or gawk um, source code. The prototype proved the basic concept of persistent scripting and supported our first round of performance evaluations. The prototype inspired gawk maintainer Arnold Robbins to re-implement similar but more general functionality in official gawk. The new persistence feature is available in version 5.2 of gawk, which was released earlier this month. Both the prototype and official persistent gawk use my persistent memory allocator called PMA. Um, both persistent scripting implementations slide a persistent heap beneath the GNU awk interpreter gawk. With help from the gawk maintainer, it wasn't very difficult to prototype this strategy. We had to add a new interface to pass the name of a heap file to the interpreter. We replaced all calls to conventional malloc with calls to our persistent heaps allocator, and we wrote code to equate the entry point of Gawk's symbol table with the root pointer of our persistent heap. This is all fairly standard stuff if you've done any persistent memory, uh, persistent memory programming. In total, our prototype added or changed under 100 lines of code to the 91,000 line Gawk source code base. Our prototype showed that PM Gawk is easy to use. First, we create a file to contain the persistent heap where script variables are going to live. This file begins life as a sparse file full of zeros. So here on the first line, we're using the trunc truncate command line utility to create a heap file called heap.pma. Its size is a multiple of the system page size. Next, we invoke persistent memory gawk and tell it where to find the heap file. Uh, in this example, um, the first invocation of gawk here contains a script that assigns a value to a variable. Everything between the single quotes uh, is, is an awk script. It's just a one-liner written on the command line. Um, then on the second persistent memory gawk execution, a different script prints the variable that has been remembered in the persistent heap file. It all just works. Notice that the two awk scripts themselves do absolutely nothing related to persistence. The scripts are the things between the single quotes. Okay? There's zero fuss. Persistence is completely effortless and transparent from the script writer's perspective. Persistence is a pure opt-in. If you don't explicitly ask for it, you're completely unaffected, and Gawk behaves as it always has. This is how all scripting languages should work. So why did we start with Gawk and not some trendier scripting language? Well, because I like Gawk and because it was easy. Gawk is a simple and well-understood language, and Gawk is a stable interpreter that isn't excessively complicated. Oh, and it's, it's very widely used. Um, uh, if you took away Gawk, most Linux systems would, 
stop, uh, stop doing most of what they do. Perl and Python are popular in part because their model of execution is to implement innovations in libraries. Changing the core interpreter is a very difficult proposition, and even getting the attention of the right maintainers is difficult. Our preferred style of persistence requires changing the interpreter and requires help from clueful maintainers. Gawk has one primary maintainer who knows the code well, who answers email promptly, and who is open to new ideas, including changes to the interpreter. Persistent scripting is implemented in official Gawk version 5.2, which was released uh, earlier this month. Yes? Uh, yeah, it's, it, he's been working on it for decades, and he knows the code well. Um, he, he basically, when we, when we made our pitch, he knew exactly what to do. Um, and he gave us instructions, and a hand, basically two guys, one of whom was an undergraduate at the time, they took care of it in a couple of weeks. Um, now, hopefully, Persistent Gawk will inspire other scripting languages to consider implementing similar capabilities. <clears throat> The persistent memory allocator that we slid beneath Gawk to create persistent Gawk is unimaginatively named PMA. It allocates memory from a file-backed memory mapping. PMA is compatible with the enormous installed base of existing hardware and software in two ways. First, it runs on conventional computers. Non-volatile memory is not required. Second, its interface is compatible with conventional malloc. It works with ordinary absolute address C pointers, not offsets. Like most persistent heaps, PMA has an initialization routine that must be called before anything else. And a PMA persistent heap also has a root pointer from which applications must be able to reach their live data on the heap, all of which is fairly standard stuff. Most persistent heaps have similar features. I wrote an article describing PMA in ACMQ magazine. You can find the source code from there. Um, Regarding crash tolerance, persistent memory gawk doesn't change anything about crash tolerance for scripting. If you're worried that a crash is going to corrupt or destroy your data, well, make backup copies of your important files, including the persistent heap and your inputs and your outputs, and ensure that after a failure, you can determine whether a script completed successfully. If a running script was interrupted by a failure, clean, it up, clean up and run it again. There's a longer discussion of crash crash tolerance for scripting in the persistent memory Gawk user's manual, which is included with Gawk 5.2. And at this point, I'm going to invite anybody on a Linux box or with Sigwin on Windows to go ahead and grab Gawk 5.2 and try to install it. Uh, if there's sufficient interest, we can do a demo after this talk, not on my laptop, but on somebody else's. So if you're feeling ambitious, go ahead and do that. We evaluated the performance of our prototype persistent memory gawk on an Optane server. The workload for our performance tests mimics an incremental log processing scenario. On each of 100 simulated days, yes? Could you go back? I think we skipped the, yeah, I just um, the workload for our performance tests mimics an incremental log processing scenario. On each of 100 simulated days, we fed a log file to the awk script that I showed you earlier. In total, the script consumed 1 billion random strings. The random string generator varied the popularity of strings over time to mimic, mimic characteristics of real web server logs. Every day, the script must output a cumulative summary of all the log files it has ever seen. We measure performance only on the final day, the hundredth day. We report the time to write output separately from the time required to sync files to durability because the sync operation is off the critical path of data analysis pipelines. We compared several ways of processing the workload using aux scripts. The naive and grossly inefficient non-incremental approach is to read the entire archive of all daily log files ever received every day which means reading 100 log files on day 100, 99 of which we've read before. Don't do that. We also tried an incremental approach implemented manually using the begin block that I showed you a little while ago. Persistent memory gawk is the easy way to implement incremental log processing. We ran several variants of persistent memory gawk varying the media beneath the PMA persistent heap containing script variables. We tried ordinary DRAM, 
SSD and Optane-based block storage, and Optane configured as non-volatile memory. Our results mostly confirm our expectations. Non-incremental processing is a total disaster. Reading and parsing the entire archive of past log files every time a new log file arrives is horrendously inefficient. And of course, the naive approach gets slower with each passing day. Incremental processing and persistence improve performance dramatically. Whether we implement incremental processing manually or with persistent gawk, the improvement is more than an order of magnitude um, in runtime. Our PM gawk prototype is a bit slower than ordinary gawk, which is not surprising. Our new PMA memory allocator is not as mature and as sophisticated as glibc malloc. In particular, PMA doesn't optimize small allocations the way standard malloc does. Um, ordinary gawk with standard malloc is about 8% faster than PM gawk when the PMA persistent heap is in DRAM. In the spirit of scripting, persistent memory gawk trades a little performance for a lot of convenience. When the persistent heap uh, lives in Optane non-volatile memory, PM gawk becomes considerably slower. This isn't too surprising. Optane is slower than DRAM, though of course the comparison isn't fair because NVM can provide durability. For our persistent work, scripting workload, putting the persistent heap in DAX mode uh, NVM doesn't make much sense. We just included this result for completeness. For our workload, if you want the persistent heap containing script variables to be durable, you can place the persistent heap in an ordinary file backed by block storage. The PMA library will map the heap file into DRAM, so PMGawk will run at DRAM speed. Our only surprising performance result is that it takes a long time to push the persistent heap down to block storage. <laughs> As we'd expect, Optane configured as a block device, as, as block storage, is a lot faster than an SSD, but the absolute magnitudes of the sync times exceed our expectations in both cases. In one sense, this isn't a huge concern because, as I mentioned earlier, pushing data to durability isn't on the critical path of data analysis pipelines. But still, we wonder what's going on. Well, remember the, the end block of our little awk script where we print out the daily summary report? From a logical standpoint, that's a read-only operation on the two associative arrays involved. But it turns out that Gawk implements the for loop here in such a way that many, many pages of the persistent heap are modified as a side effect of walking through the associative arrays. The performance hit at sync time that we saw on the previous slide is a consequence. Dirtying ordinary ephemeral memory is no big deal, but with persistent memory, more dirty data, more dirty pages means more work for whatever mechanism pushes dirty data down to durability. To avoid needless overheads, avoid gratuitous changes to persistent memory, something we've known for a long time. Um, the persistent memory Gawk prototype that my co-authors implemented in a fork of Gawk 5.1 was compelling enough to convince the maintainer of GNU Gawk Arnold Robbins, to re-implement persistent memory Gawk in the official Gawk. The new persistence feature uh, first appears in Gawk 5.2, released earlier this month. Compared to the prototype, official PM Gawk has a slightly different interface, which we'll see in a moment. Official PM Gawk remembers script-defined variables and data, just like our prototype, but it goes further. Official persistent memory Gawk also remembers user-defined functions. As we'll see, this is a cool new capability. Like the prototype, official persistent memory Gawk uses my PMA persistent memory allocator. I'll show you a few performance evaluations based on official persistent memory Gawk. Um, lots of information about official PM Gawk is available in the user manual, which is included with Gawk 5.2. Our uh, persistent memory Gawk prototype activated persistence by passing the name of a heap file by, via a command line option. Official PM Gawk activates persistence by passing a heap file via an environment variable. The effect is the same. As long as persistent memory Gawk can see the name or can find the name of uh, a heap file, it remembers script-defined variables in a persistent heap, which can be passed between unrelated scripts. Now, in this case, from the top, we're creating a sparse, uh, logically all zeros, heap file using the truncate utility. The size of the file is a multiple of the system page size. Then we set an environment variable on the second line that 
persistent memory Gawk will look for to see if a heap file has been specified. After that, every time we invoke Gawk, because the Gawk interpreter can see the environment variable telling it where to find a heap file, the persistence feature is activated. So on the first Gawk invocation here, third line, third dollar sign prompt, uh, script number one, everything between these single quotes, assigns a value to a variable. Then on the next Gawk invocation, Gawk again can see the environment variable telling it where to look for a heap file. That activates persistence. And a second Gawk script, everything between the single quotes on the second Gawk invocation, increments the variable uh, on the persistent heap and prints it. 47 plus 7 is 54. So it, it works. Yep? Uh, this seems a little limiting in that uh, you have to use one file. In other words, the original file is going to be No, no, the, the, no, the, 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 the rule is you can, only, uh, you can only use one file at a time, right? One invocation of the interpreter can use at most one heap file, right? But you can have 47 different heap files, but you can't, you can't use more than one of them at a time. So you have to just set that Gawk persistent file every time you want to change? Well, the, the, yes, um, and, you can, and the prototype you do that with a command line flag. Here you do it by setting an environment variable. Right? And there's a, there's, there's a different way of passing the environment variable that I'm going to show you on the next slide. Uh, so using an ambient environment variable, as in this example, can be error prone. For example, if you forget to unset the environment variable when you no longer want persistence, you could get into, you could get, confuse yourself in that way. So um, bash allows you to pass environment variables on a per command basis. Uh, and a shell alias, as in this example, makes per command environment variables succinct and ergonomic. So if you do it this way, then when you want non-persistent gawk, you say gawk. And when you want persistence, you say pm space gawk. It's just a different way of accomplishing the, uh, the same purpose. Okay. okay, so the coolest new aspect of official persistent memory gawk is persistent functions. If persistence is activated, user-defined functions are stored in the persistent heap in the heap file, just like script-defined variables and data. You get behavior that looks very much like a read eval print loop in a language that never had one before. In this example, a user-defined function count um, on the first Gawk invocation counts the number of entries in a given array. Um, we define the function, fill an array, and pass the array to the function in three different awk scripts that communicate via the persistent heap. So the second invocation of awk creates an array, uh, fills 47 entries of it. The third invocation of gawk passes the array we created in the second invocation to the function that we defined in the first invocation, and we get the expected result. Okay? You can bundle functions and data in a heap file, sort of like a very coarse-grained analog of object-oriented programming. And we're just start starting to explore the kinds of new idioms that uh, persistence can give us. Yes? Uh, so I noticed 10, I don't think 10 million is a multiple of 4 of 9 6. Will it just add, will it, will it just round it to the nearest page or something? Um, it's, I, it, it, should, it should be... Uh, we would have got, well, no, it, it, that's, that's 10, me, 10 mibi, mibi bytes, right? Uh, okay, so it's, yes, so it, it's, it's, a it's a power of two, yeah. Okay, so that's what I'm saying, but if it's not a power of two, it will blow up. Um, so it, it, that's correct. It ha, it, 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 the first time around, you're in, strongly encouraged to use a multiple of the system page size. Yes, was there another question? No, just repeat. Oh, okay, okay. The, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, the concern was that the interpretation of the M on the first line here, that means uh, 2 to the 20th in this context. Okay. So, we compared official persistent memory Gox performance against two alternatives on a text analysis problem. The problem is to ingest a corpus of size n total words containing w unique words, where n is a lot greater than w, as in most uh, text bodies, 
and then serve word frequency queries with a separate with a separate script. So there's two stages in processing this workload. Read data, set up data structures, basically just awk associative arrays, and then in a separate phase, answer queries of the form, how often does the word foo occur? Okay. <clears throat> we compare persistent memory gawk against an approach that manually constructs and then dumps a frequency table during the ingest phase to serve queries. It first must parse that frequency table back into memory. We also compare against an approach that uses Gawk's RW array extension to dump an associative array following ingest and reload it to serve queries. This is an existing feature of Gawk. All three approaches inevitably require order n time to ingest the input because n is the size of the input. The interesting question is, how quickly do they serve queries? Um, all three approaches take around four minutes to ingest the uh, input that we used in these experiments into a big associative array containing word frequencies, and then persist a representation of this array that will be used to serve queries later. Manually dumping the array yields about a 70 megabyte uh, text file. The RW array approach of serializing uh, the associative array dumps a 100, roughly 150 megabyte serialization. Persistent memory gawk's persistent heap is much larger. Like the memory footprint of all three approaches during ingest, the heap file is around two gigabytes, and this is not a coincidence. Persistent memory gawk's persistent heap contains the in-memory representation of the big associative array of word frequencies. To serve queries, the manual and RW array approaches must reconstruct in memory the entire associative array containing word frequencies before serving a query by accessing a single element of that associative array. This requires time and memory proportional to the number of unique words, it's order W, which translates into around 11 seconds of time and around two gigabytes of memory in this experiment. Persistent memory gawk does not load the entire associative array into memory uh, merely to access one entry. It accesses the one entry needed to serve the query and nothing more. That's why it serves queries two orders of magnitude faster, roughly 25 milliseconds compared to 11 seconds. That's also why its query time memory footprint is so much smaller, under four megabytes compared to two gigabytes for the other approaches. Queries take order one time in memory with persistent memory gawk. So to summarize, scripting is supposed to be easy and productive, and it is, unless you need persistence. The interpreter, not individual scripts, should handle the chore of remembering your variables and functions. Retrofitting persistence onto an existing interpreter is easy with the right persistent memory allocator. Uh, my PMA allocator is compatible with malloc and does not require non-volatile memory which made it easy to implement persistent memory gawk and enables PM gawk to run anywhere. Persistent memory gawk gives you zero fuss persistence. You can decouple data ingestion from data analysis. For example, in machine learning scenarios, you can decouple the learning phase from the inference phase. These can be performed by separate scripts that communicate efficiently via persistent heaps. PM gawk accesses only the specific memory pages that it needs, so persistent array lookups remain constant time operations. <laughs> All the software presented in this talk is available as open source, and now I'm happy to take your questions. Yes? Garbage collection. Yes? Uh, so is the garbage collection associated with the user ID and the persistences only exist as long as the user ID is intact? Uh, and the garbage collection can then free up that memory when that user ID exits, or, and the corollary to that is, can you make it persistent across multiple, essentially multiple logins? Uh, the, there's, a, there's a couple of, I have to answer your question at several layers. So, okay, uh, the question was <laughs> garbage collection. Um, I will, Address, I will answer your questions without repeating them. Hopefully the questions will be clear from the answers. Okay. The question was about garbage collection and also about the persistence of data across logins, if I understand correctly, right? So, awk programmers 
have always enjoyed the moral equivalent of automatic garbage collection. If you're the guy writing the script, then you don't have to worry about explicit memory allocation or deallocation. It just works, right? Awk, the interpreter, is a C program that uses malloc and free, right? And it is the responsibility of the guy who wrote Awk, this guy Arnold Robbins, to ensure that he deallocates, um, deallocates memory, whether that memory is persistent or not. Right? So there's no, there's no uh, in terms of the, the script maintainer's perspective, the guy who writes that C program, he doesn't, have, he doesn't, he doesn't get any garbage collection. Right? He, he uses a malloc and free interface. The script-defined variables that live in the persistent heap, if you activate the persistent fe persistence feature and you stash some script-defined variables in a persistent heap, the persistent heap lives in a file. The file sticks around until you delete it. Right? Now, you can, within the limits set by the awk language, you can reclaim script-defined variables in that heap. For example, a while earlier I showed you, let's see. Oh, where is it? Here. Okay, so on the second line here, the second awk line here, we are filling an associative array, lowercase a, with 47 different values. Right? Now, under the hood, that's going to require some memory allocation. If later we said to Gawk, delete a, which means just get rid of that whole associative array. Well, under the hood, the Gawk interpreter is going to call free to reclaim that. And the persistent memory allocator, it supports free. It recycles uh, used memory. Okay? Um, the persistent heap will live on in the file. Everything else that was in the persistent heap is unchanged. Right? If you've deleted one array or an element of an array on the persistent heap, you may have a whole bunch of other variables and arrays and user-defined functions in that same persistent heap. They stick around indefinitely until you either delete the file, in which case they're all gone, or delete individual uh, array elements or arrays. Does that answer your question? Uh, okay, so now that user logs out. Yes. Does that automatically then uh, put that on, uh, free that resource from the persistent what does not get deallocated is the file in the file system. I mean, when you log out of your machine, all the files that you've created, they're not deleted or anything, unless you put those files in slash temp, right? So if you want your persistent heap to go away when you reboot the machine, put the heap file in slash temp. But if you put it in your home directory, it's like any other file, right? And you can have as many different persistent heaps as you want. You can only use one with a Gawk interpreter at a time. Yes. Um, so I have been approached by people who care about other languages. About you know why didn't you do this for X for language X because I like X better. <laughs> um, so the short answer is I will support anybody who wants to do this for Perl, Python. You know, I, I grew up on Perl. I like Perl. Um, I have no reason to believe that, assuming these interpreters are well-structured, that it's fundamentally any harder. This was really easy with Gawk, right? The hard problems with, say, Perl and Python involve the culture, right? There are battalions of maintenance programmers protecting the core interpreter of Perl or of Python. Their job is to say no to any new idea. Right? And even finding people who can understand the proposal is difficult. Right? Their model of innovation, as I mentioned earlier, is that all innovations go into libraries. The core, the core interpreter is something that a handful of carefully chosen people can muck with occasionally. Um, so adding persistence in this fashion, I'm pretty sure, requires changing a language interpreter. Right? Um, we couldn't have done it in Gawk without changing the interpreter. The social problem of 
getting people in the land of, say, Perl or Python to implement a feature like this, uh, that's, a, that's a hard sell. So if you have any friends there, or if you have Jedi mind tricks that are going to uh, persuade them, then... Okay. Okay, let, let, let's do it. Yep. Yes, sir. Right. Well, so um, it, it, so it turns out uh, it's not in this talk. It's not in this paper. But using my persistent memory allocator in a C plus uh, plus program is it can be very easy. So, for example, if you want to turn a C plus plus STL container into a persistent container, well, the crude hillbilly way of doing that is by overloading global operator new and global operator delete. That's ten lines of code. And now, say, an STL map is a persistent map. It all just works, right? So using my persistent memory allocator in a C++ program is, uh, it, it just works. Has anybody downloaded Gawk and tried to install this? Well, if you want a demo and you're willing to do it on your, your laptop, I'll, I'm happy to look over your shoulder. Um, a lot of people have done it, and uh, I'm, I'm actually confident that all will go well. We could, if we want, adjourn now. We've got, we've got a few more minutes. I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, grab me in the hall if uh, you'd like to talk, uh, talk later. And I definitely am interested in the, uh, in the, in the Python angle. Well, thank you. <laughs>